This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 46, Laura King and Peak Performance. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. One of the most interesting things I find about hypnosis is that, of course, with this process, we can look at it in terms of helping someone to solve a problem, helping someone to go from a state of challenge to perhaps a state of solution. Though one of the aspects of the process, and indeed, if you fold this element into your sessions, I think you'll find a much better experience, is to look at these areas where we can go from good to great. And I'd even reference the point of view that whether it's a public speaker, whether it's an athlete, whether it's anything in life, to start from a position of resources, draw out the skills, abilities, and strategies that your client absolutely has, and then model their own excellence. I'd characterize it sometimes as steal from the best because you have that, rather than working from a blank slate, you've got that perfect palette of resources and abilities and strengths often right there inside of that client. And this is what uh, sort of motivated me to reach out to Laura King and specifically with uh, a program she's got coming up at the NGH convention. I've known of Laura for quite some time now in the hypnosis profession, whether it's meeting at uh, the NGH convention convention or seeing some of her work online, but specifically this program she's got coming up, Six Keys to Winning Sports Certification. It's a post-conference offering at the NGH convention this year, August 2015. You're going to hear us in this interview uh, a very personal background to hypnosis, as well as someone who's just out there, again, as I like to feature here, someone who's out there doing the work, getting a lot of great results, and really just spreading the awareness about how wonderful this is. I'll point you to a couple of resources, and as always, we'll put the links to these in the show notes over at worksmarthypnosis.com. A couple of websites to check out. I'll uh, make it easy if you go to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash Laura King. I'll actually make that redirect over to the NGH page for the program she's doing this year. The links will be directly inside of the show notes as well. So just go to Work Smart Hypnosis and up in the search bar, just type in Laura King. It'll bring you to the right place. You can check out Laura's website, laurakinghypnosis.com, as well as Summit Hypnosis and Wellness. Dot com. Let's jump right in. This is session number 46, Laura King and Peak Performance. About 35 years ago, I had a lot of depression and issues. I'd been inside and out of a traditional rehab. And the traditional rehab worked on one level, but I still tried to commit suicide a third time And so when I was in intensive care, my mother decided that maybe all the drugs and Palm Beach Institute wasn't working. So my mother sought out a hypnotist that she had heard about. And that was, you know, 34 years ago. That was in the 70s. And that was a big deal for her to do that back then. But this woman that she introduced me to, it just so happened when she contacted her, she was in Arizona and she was just moving to Fort Lauderdale about six miles from my house. So I don't believe there are any accidents. I believe it was a God wink. And this person, Dorothy Gates, saved my life. So through the years of ups and downs with several marriages and children, I used hypnosis to, I say, survive, to make life better on every level that I used it to, to the extent that I used it. And about 15 years ago, about now, Dorothy, my mentor, passed away. She was in California at the time. And I came back from the funeral and I said to my husband, what am I doing the next 15 years of my life? Our kids had just gone to college and I'd always thought, what would I do after the kids were to college? And I always thought I'd go to California, work with her to promote her book on hypnosis and all of her training. And she was a very special lady. And my husband looked at me, says, you do it. And I looked at him, I said, I don't think so. I said, I have a fear of my own voice. I wouldn't record my voice to even do the phone answer machine. I couldn't even speak to my Girl Scout troop. I had to hire a co-leader. And 
I wasn't going to go in a room and hypnotize somebody. I had issues as a child being molested. And I said, you know, that's ridiculous. He looked at me and he laughed. He says, well, if hypnosis works, you can be hypnotized to do all of it. And I went, hmm, good point. So about Gosh. three weeks later, I was enrolled at Omni Hypnosis School because for about a year of my life, all these things came in the mail and about four or five different people had recommended Omni Hypnosis School. So I went and did Jerry Kine's program. And that was the beginning. And I've taken everybody's, just about everyone. You name them, Ron Esslinger, Cal Banyan, Will Horton. They're all my friends. And I've been going to the convention now for 15 years. And I have a full-time practice. I see about 50 to 52, 57 people a week on average. And I take it very seriously. I'm, I'm in all areas. I worked in the cancer world for 10 years at Palm Beach Oncology in a wellness center they had have. And one of my girls that worked for me took over that job full time because I liked my practice. Besides that, I now teach it and I am lucky. I do a lot of sports and I've written quite a few books, but I really believe in what I do. I use it in all areas of my life. You said you lost some weight. I lost 45 pounds with it. My daughter, Larissa Brazier, she lost 98 pounds with hypnosis. We're family. She's now a hypnotherapist too. My son is certified. My husband just says we all keep him hypnotized all the time. That's why he does the laundry. <laughs> but that's basically on my life is helping people. Um, my mission is not about me. I'm only a facilitator to help people. Yeah. I'd love to rewind to something because I hear different pieces of feedback when someone says that they see upwards of 50 to 60 clients a week. Is that in a one-on-one -on -one format for you? Is that a group format? That is one-on-one. -on -one. My average Beautiful. day is from nine to seven or eight and five days a week. And on weekends, I work on my books and different things. In the last year, I've been working on taking some time off, like doing something. I always wanted a horse back in my life. So a couple months ago, I got a horse back at my house. So I'm incorporating some stuff. I'm, and this is my big year this year. And not that age bothers me, but I'm turning 60 this year. So I'm kind of doing some things differently in that my husband told me we needed to practice retirement so I'm practicing a little bit and um, not working every day, but I still during season. See, in Florida, as you know, we have a season. It's usually November right. through, well, it used to be November through April. Well, a lot of my clients stayed through May, and some of them were still there when I left to come to North Carolina. I'm on vacation right now in North Carolina. So my season's gotten longer, which is good. And it is a nice way to expand. So I do a lot of sports now in my practice. So that's one of the reasons I put together the last book. I had gone to the convention years ago, the first one actually, and I'd been working for a professional golfer. And Joan King taught a class, Hypnosis for Golfers. So I took that class and it was about releasing performance, anxiety, concentration, peak performance, um, releasing fear. And I sat there and decided to heck with golfers, equestrians need it because I had spent my life at the show ring with myself and with my daughter. That's how I started doing a lot of sports. So I wrote a book called The Power to Win for a publishing company, Global Peacock. Then I took that and I made it for golfers. Then I made it for tennis players. And all of a sudden last year I went, oh, I can't make one for every sport because it cost a lot to have them produced. So I made one called Awesome Athletic Performance. And then that's when I created a certification for that. And that's the National Hypnosis Guild chose that for me to teach at the convention this year. Nice, nice. And I love to point out the aspect that you started with the golf. You brought that over to the equestrian sports. How much of this would you say gets into the context of I tend to phrase it this way at times, that very often the work comes down to, how do you feel now? How would you rather feel? What are those things you're doing now? What are those things you'd rather be doing? And if we break it into those components, we often start to find this universal structure that, of course, inside of it, there's so much customization to be had. How much of that, would you say, systematic nature have you found to working with athletes? Well, basically, let's chunk it even a little farther down. All athletes know what they're striving for, meaning they learn their sport. They see a role model of how to do it. They have a coach. 99.9% .9 of them do. Mm -hmm. 
and Mm -hmm. they're being told what to do to improve what they're doing. So when you get the basic components that I'm teaching, the release performance anxiety, the release fear, the basic relaxation, the concentration, the peak performance, once you get the basic core of what every sport needs to be at its best, and I don't use the word perfect, I use doing it correctly, because when a sports person is working toward perfectionism, it's always a mindset that they can never be perfect enough, therefore they tend to criticize their performance too much and they can't get to that next level. Your elite athletes or your, you know, I work with Olympians and very high-end sports people on all levels, And that mindset has to be that you can do it correctly. If you do each movement correctly, each part of your sport correctly, you're going to have a better overall performance. But back to the basics of what you just asked me, once you get rid of that core, they know what they want to achieve. So you were saying in their mindset to transform them into a better performer, they know what they want to get. So it's using, you know, the subconscious mind's ability to change that, whether they're auditory learners, kinesthetic learners, or visual learners. So you basically break that down and then give them the tools they need on the subconscious level so it's an automatic response to how they want to perform. Now, the words we use, some people, you know, I've I've taught this several times. I spoke about it at the Solid Gold last year. that They didn't have Solid Gold this year. So 2014, I spoke on the subject, and I did a one hour on it last year at the convention. It is really thinking about the words. So I've been asked by a lot of people, how can you do so many sports without knowing the sport? Well, it's true. (laughs) The comment is you ask them what they want to do. They're going to tell you, I'm not a cheerleader. I don't know how to do a backhand spring tuck, but I can sure ask my client what they want to do better. And they'll tell you exactly how to do it, how to do a backhand spring tuck. And if they are wanting to improve it, you can YouTube and get a visual, watch it with them and hypnotize them and they'll do it. So they know the verbiage they need. Therefore, you can put that verbiage in your verbiage in a hypnosis session. I found that to be so true, especially looking at, there's an odd story of an article that was printed in my local area that suddenly I had a bunch of gymnastics people here in my office. And the phrase I typically use was, if I call stuff by the wrong name, just laugh at me. And then finally, I had a tumbler, which is great because there's no apparatus. But you're so right on this point of view of just ask them. They already have that expertise. And really, from our perspective, too, by the time that athlete is in front of us, especially, let's say, if it's the teenage athlete, we can assume they already know what they need to be doing. Right. They're already really good at that. And I'd even share the anecdote that yeah. when I was like seven years old, my parents uh, put me on a soccer team. And I was so horrible at soccer that my only goal was to at least kick the ball once or twice. You know, forget getting it in the goal. I just wanted to at least kick the ball. The bar was set relatively low and I didn't excel at it. Then I lost interest in that and moved on to taking piano lessons. And I'd share that anecdote to point out, though, that My parents would have never called someone like you or me to work with myself on the soccer. That wasn't something that was an interest of mine. So we already have this foot in the door that you've got someone of an elite status. You've got someone of a great skill level. They have the expertise. And just to simply ask the questions about what is it you need to do better? What is it that's happening? And what I find across the board is if you say, what is your coach telling you to do? If you're here and you're having trouble What is the coach yelling at you about usually? (laughs) What are the words? And then what I find to be so interesting, and I write articles for equestrian trainers, magazines, and I do a lot of different levels. I speak for Robert Dover out, and he does a clinic um, during season. I got to speak there this year. Um, Another dressage person, Linda Gray, I spoke for her group. But the basics of what they tell them, I find that 90% of them are being yelled at of what not to do. And as you and I both know, our subconscious mind really doesn't hear don't and not. So it produces what they were just told not to do. So in helping a student, I can't tell them to go tell their coach to put a sock in it, but I, <laughs> I can't reprogram their brain that when they hear that, they can cancel it and only focus on how to do it. 
and that makes their performance become even better. But basically, it is hearing what the coach is telling them they need to do to improve. And if you hypnotize them to do just that, they do it. And another trick that I find quite amazing, well, Billy Schilling, he, you know, is a hypnotist and a researcher. He's a great guy. Billy's in my neighborhood. So. Oh, he is. <laughs> Billy. Yeah, he's down here or he's up here for you. He's great. Anyway. He, he's proven, you know, that you are what you think. A thought creates a physical reaction and your imagination is stronger than knowledge. They're proving that just doing that visualization of the way you want to do it is just as solid as doing it. Get that mind seeing how they want to do it. And then I use that with role modeling. I've had people come back to me and say, you know, so-and-so said I was riding just like so-and-so. That's who you hypnotized me to ride like. That's my role model, you know. Across the board, we know that the brain has mirror neurons, and we do mirror that that we see. So we want to mirror the better performance. Raising the bar to the actual mindset of what the possibility is, is creating that possibility for the person to perform. So I'd love to ask you this, and it kind of takes things in a slightly different perspective. As we're talking about sports, so far, some of the themes expressed have been about changing some of the language, talk about what you want rather than what you don't want, bringing the mindset towards that peak performance. There's a wonderful constant controversy around the use of hypnotic age regression inside of sports improvement, to which my first thought would always be to say that regression is a category. The moment we're associating someone into a moment of strength and a moment where they were in that state of peak performance and drawing out the resource, building an anchor to trigger off later, we are doing age regression. Just curious to hear your thoughts on the use of regression inside of sports improvement. Well, I think regression is used any time we ask a question of what happened to the person in their life. Yes. Any point from where I'm sitting right now, just telling you my story was age regression in my brain. Absolutely. I regress back to a time of depression. I don't have the residual effect of it because I've done all my work with hypnosis, so I have no emotional attachment to it anymore. I can tell you my story and not worry about it all today. Like it doesn't have an effect on me because we've done, I have been through every program that we offer almost at the convention and I've done the work. So do I use regression in a sports setting? Of course I do. Because 90% of the people come in and they have something that happened to them in their life that relates to the sport that they're doing, and not all of it's good. It could be a bad trainer. It could be a bad fall. It could be someone put them down, bullied. There's all kinds of venues and all kinds of connections. So do we use regression in sports? Technically, we have to. But then you've got to categorize, you know, Cal Banyan has a great program. He calls it Five Path. My mentor, the lady who trained me 34 years ago, hers was a little different. I think everybody that practices hypnosis, whether we call it Five Path, we call it age regression, whatever, any time we are going to when the person is experiencing something negative or positive, it is a regression if it's behind yes. them. And if we go forward, we're projecting that to give a roadmap and a timeline therapy forward to how they want to do it. We are creating the blueprint for them to do it, to override any negative. So to neutralize the negative of the past, we have to call it regression because it is. You know, how many ways is there to skin a cat? You know, I mean, I don't know. You, Regression is regression, whether it's you label it five path or you label it how Celeste do it, does it or anybody. It is the process of disconnecting the negative concept that was associated with the activity they want to do. And to do that, you do have to relive part of it, but you don't have to go and totally spend, you know, five days on it. Like some of Billy's latest research is just the visualization replacing it is almost just as good. So, but it's still mm -hmm. regression in my term and what I think. Yeah. And again, breaking into the bigger category that, you know, even inside of NLP, the, the pattern of changing personal history, it's basically at its core, a regression process 
of just plugging in a different outcome, plugging in a different possibility, or even a dash of reparenting of just what if that information was there. You know, the metaphor that I would use would be that um, the person in the gym working out, if they're doing the pull-ups, they should also be doing the push-ups, working the muscle in the different direction. You see everybody on the floor doing the sit-ups, but they also should be doing the back extension, stretching the muscle in the opposite way. So by stretching the mind in that direction of as if you could have done it this way is often enough to begin to break that old pattern and integrate that new one. And Jason, to really think about this for a minute, in all life experiences, if we are honing in on a skill and improving something about ourselves or helping a client improve something, they have to create a thought process of what it is they want to improve. It's, you know, in some business things, it's called taking the lid off, raising the lid a little bit of the possibility. In the dressage world, I don't know if you're familiar with equestrians, but there's a high end of riding called dressage. And everybody's been in this level of 70s and the score, and the highest is 100. And everybody likes to get in the 70s, high 70s. Now, some people have broken into the 80s. Well, there's this one girl from England, and she's now scoring in the 90s. What she has done is lifted the lid of possibilities. Now, everybody that's coming to me, we have a different role model. Now, my scores of all my clients are going from the 70s to the 80s and haven't hit the 90s yet. But actually, I have. Not I, my clients. So <laughs> it is. It it depends on the sport and how you want to raise the lid. But you know, it's like I, Will Horton came down and taught in my last um, hypnosis training class a couple weeks ago. And in sports, you know, we always talk about the client that comes in to match up their expectations. The weekend warrior that comes in and sits in the chair and says, a golfer, let's say, he wants to, his role model's Tiger Woods. So my first response is, well, do you want to wake up tomorrow morning and exercise for two hours, go to the golf course and hit 5,000 balls, then have lunch (laughs) and then go to the office for an hour, then go back to the gym and work out for two hours? And they look at me and go, well, no, I have a full-time job. I just want to play better golf on the weekend. I go, well, we've got to pick a better role model. So you still have to match up their possibilities to equal their expectations. And I think that's an important approach. Yeah, and I, I love the concept of highlighting that, you know, breaking through that ceiling of it. The, the classic example is, you know, for years people would say that it was impossible to run a mile under four minutes. And then suddenly, I think it was like 1950, someone did it. And then years later, high school kids were doing it. That when that expectation is there, but you're you're right on that point that it has to be appropriate within them. It has to be appropriate within their goals. Of all things, the, the book uh, Four Hour Body by Timothy Ferris, there's a nice little side note in that book where he talks about how he spent a total of four hours at a gym in one month and gained like 30 pounds of muscle mass. And you're reading the chapter and it's interesting how he begins to highlight though Well, unless you're willing to wake up at three in the morning and eat to fuel the muscles, expect it's going to take a week longer. Unless you're willing to do this, it's going to take a week longer. If you're going to do this, it's going to take a week longer. And bringing in that reality, though, of, you know, to follow that exact path, we have to be modeling the excellence of what they're doing. And unless we're that full timer, unless I mean, it's like the high school gymnast that I'd see here in the office that the Olympian is being privately tutored sometimes and they've got that full support system and here's the one in front of me that is still a cheerleader, is still going to school, is still active within her church and is still doing all these other things as opposed to that's entirely her life. Right, exactly. And then matching that up to what that means. Now, one thing I have found to be very true is if someone like I was working with a cheerleader And she is a senior in high school, but she has a, this was last year, she had possibilities of getting a scholarship to go to Florida State with cheerleading, but she still had to have the grades, she still had to have everything. So there was a lot riding on it that was possibilities for her. So you still have to know how to put all that together to get them to where they need to be. So then I start coaching on helping them get their grades easier, the concentration, all my learn stuff that I do, making their test taking be easier. So that I end up incorporating all areas of it to get that sports, the elite athlete sport to be easier for them to accomplish. 
by incorporating all that they need at school also. And the fact is, as soon as we have that foot in the door of the change process, it starts to generalize out and it becomes easier, I'd imagine, for you to then move on to other aspects of that. I've run into the same thing with a football player recently that, again, he was here for some goals within his game, but then specifically, if the grades weren't there, he wasn't even in line for any of these scholarships. But the same aspects that we were using to sharpen his game were the same aspects that were then easily folded in. It's how I've got open right now. The presentation for NGH this year, Six Keys to Winning Sports Certification, that I'm looking through some of the key points here of relaxation, positive self-talk, gaining concentration, release of performance anxiety from fearful to fearless, as well as the expectations, which when you look at that, even if we're not working with a sports person, There's a great system. There's a great formula for the public speaker. There's a great system for the test taker. Exactly. Tell us a little bit more about uh, that class that's coming up. What I did is I broke down the six keys, like you just listed them for me. Thank you. Awesome. I cheated. They're in front of me. (laughs) (laughs) Breaking that down, I go into each one and I, well, I wrote a book on it. So we basically go through the book, but I teach the hypnotist how to utilize the ability to do these different keys. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to give you a script and you go help someone get rid of performance anxiety. Well, there's a lot to it. I want to teach the hypnotist how they become aware and open their minds to the way to tap into it. Because some one person might say they don't have performance anxiety, but everything they tell you is all about performance anxiety. And you don't want to label it on them, but you want to be able to utilize the ability to release it by replacing it with the ability to play their sport better. So in all sports, it is the process of knowing how to release fear. Now, fear is all different types. It could be a fear of part of what happens on the field. It could be a fear of failure. It could be a fear of success. There's a lot of venues of fear. So I go through all the processing of what the types of fears can be and how to see them and how to utilize and how to move the person through their fear and get over it so we can install the principles of their ability to have their proficiency be extended in a higher level, which is what you're doing. Because, you know, when fear, jealousy and guilt are involved in the brain, it totally affects the way a human being functions. When we get rid of guilt, jealousy, and fear, we end up allowing the efficiency and effectiveness of our ability to do what we want to do extend itself and get peak performance. And in peak performance, there's also this, this is what I found across the board in a lot of high-end athletes, they get to a certain level and they're afraid of being the winner. They don't like what the winner looks like. The perception is that, you know, in the subconscious mind, logically, they don't know this, you know, but when they tell you, you say, well, who is a good role model that wins? Well, so-and-so, but I don't like her personality. She's rude. She's socially unacceptable. She's not very nice. And I'll go, oh, do you really want to be just like that, huh? Oh, God, never. I never want to win because the fear of looking like that. So you've got to neutralize that they can be the winner and without fear of being like the person they don't like. This is a little off here, but it goes right along with this with a different metaphor So I'm not talking about sports, but I'm talking about a salesperson. Girl comes to hear me speak, really nice girl. I've known her for several years. She has her MBA from MIT. She's brilliant. She worked for a big corporation. She left that corporation because she wanted to go into sales so that she could make more money. And she saw me at the function and she says, I'm going to get your sales CD to help me. I said, that'll help. She tells me a little story and I tell her that would be a good one. I go, well, you really need to make an appointment with me. She goes, well, I can't afford to right now because I've made this transition. I'm not doing very well on sales. I'm not making, I got a little bit left of my savings from my last job, blah, blah, blah. So about a month goes by, she calls me up and she tells me the story again. And she says, um, it's working in this area, but I can't seem to close a sale. And I go, okay, listen to self-confidence. It sounded like, you know, she needed some more self-confidence. So a couple weeks later, she calls me up. She says, gosh, I'm feeling so good about myself. My relationship with my boyfriend's better. This telling me all these wonderful things, but I can't close a sale. I said, listen, you know what? You need to see me. Come see me. 
you pay me after you make your first sale. She says, really, Laura? I went, sure. She says, you're that confident you can help me. I said, pretty much. And so she comes in, she sits down and I look at her and I go, well, what do you think of a salesperson? Oh, a used car salesman. I never want to be one. (laughs) Oh, really? Well, we got rid of that. She became the top salesman where she was, went to another job, became the top salesman there. Then she traveled with a career track company teaching on how to do this. And then she came back, got tired of traveling. Now she works for a big company in town and she's their top salesman making really, really well. It was getting rid of the perception of what she believed it meant to be, to be what she wanted to be. So you got to look at your athletes and you've got to see what their perception is of being the best. And if they don't like what it looks like, they're going to self-sabotage themselves some way during the activity of doing their sport to keep from being it. And it's all subconscious, as we all know, as hypnotist. Yeah, I had a similar example of a client who came in that was hitting a bit of a barrier, was oddly enough doing quite well in his business. And it was a business that he had inherited from his father and the experience, though, of, oh, anybody who makes more than blank is greedy. Yes. Was that pattern that was just running over and over. And sure enough, as if you could set your watch to it, he'd hit that specific number sometime around September, October, which is quite good. But then the next few months, everything would begin to pour into debt and become a challenge. And just simply changing that expectation, which not even accounting for inflation, of course, but just changing that expectation of it's okay for him to make that money. It's okay. No, I I love the aspect, and you speak about this too. I've heard it from you before about the real value of as we're out there in our public, building up our profession, building up our businesses, that's what then allows us to then afford the time to go to conventions, to go to workshops, to take classes, to improve ourselves. So again, the more we're successful, the more we're all successful. And just by building that up, you know, we have that responsibility, I'd say, rather than just that right to do so. Yeah, and to go back to, you know, what we do this for, we do it because we know hypnosis is a tool that really works. And like you, I'm assuming that the hypnosis helped you lose the weight and helped you be successful in your career. You know, we use this ourselves as being a role model of it also is part of it. That's what motivates me to when I give a class or when I do the stuff for the guild, I really give to everybody. You know, you don't walk in and you don't have to go buy in the back end of what I'm doing stuff. You come to my class and I give you all the tools. I give you the PowerPoints to go use out there, put your name on it. I give you the the process, the resources, so you can go out there, step out of my class, and actually put your sports certification out there boldly and go start knocking on doors for the, the roller skating rinks, ice skating rinks, gymnastic places, the cheerleading places, the swimming. There's so much business out there. And it's just going and teaching, you know, what people know is what they know and what they don't know is what they don't know. And the more you can educate them and it's an easy process to be able to do that because the tools I give you, it gives you the expertise to believe in yourself that you can actually do any sport, you know, step by step, step processing for you to follow the client to achieve their goals and, and to customize the way that you want them to do it. So the tools that you leave in is a technique, but it's also a reason and a place of using the things. Because I incorporate hypnosis, NLP, and the natural laws of the mind. So you're putting it all together to help your client achieve their success. And it makes it a lot easier to do. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast at WorkSmartHypnosis.com. Hey, it's Jason Lynette here with one last quick favor. Just a quick request. If you would head over to the iTunes listing for this program and leave a quick review, that is the number one way to help us out. That helps to bump up the downloads, spread the awareness around this program, and, well, simply, it just makes me quite happy. So do us a favor. Head over there right away. Just go to WorkSmartHypnosis.com. At the very top of the page, click the iTunes button. That'll take you right there. Leave your review. Thanks so much.
Hey there, it's Jason, and I want you to be one of the first to find out as we upload amazing new content. So do this right now. Click the subscribe button right here on this video. That's going to link you to our YouTube channel here, and you will be the first to find out as new resources and downloads are made available. Do it now.